today we're going to talk a little bit about doing some specialty landings, which includes slips and correct landing procedures, and also talk a little bit about airports and their markings. First, we have our uh, model, and it's um, actually a little helicopter because I didn't have a gyro to use, but it should suffice. And we have our airport layout that uh, is sitting on the kitchen table. And we'll talk about these markings and taxiways and things like that. And we have a little railroad track here. And the railroad track we are using to demonstrate slips across a track or road. And some of the old timers used to use this to teach people how to do slips without losing altitude. And I'll discuss this a little bit more in just a minute. To begin this segment, let's talk a little bit about airports, runways, and runway markings briefly. First, you can see here that we have a uh, parking area. You can see I have a crazy drawing of a single. The entrance to taxiway alpha, a gyro, and a twin, and of course the model we use for demonstration purposes, our uh, converted helicopter that will become a gyroplane in just a few minutes as we talk a little bit more about it. On a typical airport, the taxiways are all in yellow and they have solid lines. Generally speaking, you know which taxiway you're on because the taxiway letter, for instance alpha, will be in yellow on a black background. Taxiways that have arrows to and out of the taxiway are going to be in a yellow background with black letters. So you know which taxiway you are on because the taxiway you are on, for instance, if you taxi out on Alpha here and go down to taxiway Bravo, you'll know you're on taxiway Alpha because, as I said before, you will have a black background with a yellow letter. However, you might have a sign right here at the entrance that might point in directions showing where the other taxiways are and the locations of them, and those arrows are going to be the opposite, or they will be a yellow background with black letters. Now let's look a little bit at the end of the markings of the runway. Okay, here on the end of 3-5 right, we have a run-up area. And that's usually where you do your systems checks, check your magnetos if you have them, and make sure everything is running smoothly and run your engine RPM up. And also make sure, especially, that it can come down to idle so that on final, when you're coming into land, the engine doesn't die. You'll notice the hold short line. it has actually a solid line on the taxiway side and the dash line on the runway side. Now the easiest way to remember this is, as you can tell, the runway has dashes down the middle. But the taxiways usually are always solid lined in yellow. Runway lines are in white. So if you remember and you need to know which is the hold short side, you need to stay before your access to the runway on the solid line side or the taxiway side. The stashed line side is the runway side. In this particular drawing you're also going to see some stripes at the end of the runway and we'll discuss those in a moment. Of course 3-5 is your uh, directional heading of the compass as you're approaching the runway or on the runway meaning that you're facing almost north and right gives you the traffic pattern of that particular runway. There's also two other sets of markings on this and we'll take a look at those again in just a minute. On the other end, you'll see that on Taxiway Echo, there's another run-up area on the other end, plus another hold short line that's labeled, and that runway is 17 left. Okay, now let's talk about the runway stripes themselves. If we look over here, we see that there's eight stripes at the end of the runway. That actually tells you what the width of the runway is and it, there's not a particular rhyme or reason to it, but they're about 12 and a half feet per stripe. Eight stripes represents 100 feet wide. The next set of markings over here, they'll call the touchdown point most of the time, and that one is 500 feet from the end of the runway. The big stripes that you see on a lot of uh, runways are the 1,000 footers, and a lot of times they call that the aiming point. Now we're going to discuss slips across a track or road. I have not seen very many new CFIs discuss this, but old timers used to always require that this be done by their students. This is not to be confused with a slip that is designed to lose altitude. This slip is designed to lose no altitude whatsoever. 
by taking our model, the objective of this slip is to simply slide it as if on ice left and right across the road like this, keeping the aircraft perfectly parallel to the road using just enough cross control to slide it across the road paralleling whatever it is that you're going, in the, in the direction that you are going. We don't want to do this by driving it across the road in this manner. Also, this is designed to lose no altitude whatsoever. So the amount of cross control that you put in on this type of slip is minimal. Just enough to allow the, head, the front of the aircraft to stay straight and gently slide, paralleling the road back and forth. Now we'll take a look at this from a different angle. So the aircraft once again paralleling the track or road, not turning, driving through it, paralleling. While landing on 3-5 right, normally we would come down in a headwind, nice and even, keep a flare in continuously and set it down, holding the nose wheel off until it sets down on itself, practically without any movement whatsoever. This can still be viewed as a touch and go, but technically it's almost a full stop. Because if you do it correctly on a gyro, you should hold the back wheel steady and right as it stops, that front comes down and drops like that. The reason why you want to have a good practice of doing that is because many gyros have a non-castering nose wheel. And if you come in on a crosswind, let's say the wind is coming from this direction, normally the aircraft would want to crab into the wind. Well, I teach my students to come in straight and not crab, and there's some reasons why that that we'll discuss in a moment. But on approach, if they come in straight and they have the rotor tilted into the wind, and they have a slight cross control to keep the nose parallel to the runway, the nose wheel may not be perfectly straight on touchdown. So I have them come in, complete the flare with a lot of follow through, nose up, and let the nose come down. And as it comes down, center the rudder so the nose wheel comes down straight and not cocked. If the nose wheel comes down straight and you let the nose wheel hit the ground on landing and you have a strong crosswind without a castering nose wheel, there is a chance that with the rotor tilted this way and the nose wheel correcting for the crab, that it may want to dart and roll over on its side. That's why you want to land and have follow through and keep the landing procedure full flared and follow through like a golf swing all the way until completion and then let the nose wheel come down with the gyro practically stopped, or if not stopped completely, to prevent any of those types of issues. Now many of you know I fly an auto gyro MTO Sport. The MTO doesn't have a tail wheel. That makes it even more important to come in straight. On a tail wheel gyro, like this little helicopter model, let's say it had a tail wheel, if we're cocked, the tail wheel touches first, the center of motion straightens out the gyro, then it can come down and it can land, okay? I teach them, regardless of the gyro they fly, whether it's a Sparrowhawk, an RAF, it doesn't really matter, to try to keep it coming in straight regardless. Because in an MTO, if it comes in and there's no tail wheel, and the wheels catch at an angle like this, it wants to do a duck walk. And a lot of times, if you don't catch that, it will flip that gyro onto its side. So, how do we correct for this? Well, this is why I teach people doing slips across the road. It's because uh, 200 yards to 400 yards, I want them to have that gyro paralleling the road. And then all they have to do is hold a minor correction to do a gentle slip over to align it up to correct for drift with the stick only. Then they can gently move the stick slightly side to side to keep the alignment. The nose is already straight and they come and land with a good flare, touching either toe wheel first or evenly on the back wheels, flaring completely with the nose up until it finally relaxes to come down at a complete stop. Then, if they roll a little bit forward and want to do a touch and go, they're already rolling in a straight pattern and can go ahead and take off correctly. By practicing those slips across the road at a high altitude, not losing any altitude with minor, minor cross control, remember it only takes about 3% cross control to do that, they're able to easily keep that aligned with the runway and have a very good quality type of pattern when they're landing and they form a good habit. One of the problems that you also have, if you come in crabbed a lot 
and then you skip too slow right on touchdown and you want to kick it straight. You don't have enough air sometimes going over the rear controlling surfaces of the gyro to make it effective enough to correct that crab right on touchdown and therefore you can land crooked and have another issue without adding power. So what about strong crosswinds? Well on a strong crosswind you're going to come in and you're going to go ahead and correct just like I said for that with a slip. This slip is just enough to keep it straight and centered and sometimes you may have to keep a little bit of RPM in to keep air flowing over the controlling surfaces and let it come down when it is ready. Don't force it to get on the ground and as the rear touches down immediately cut your throttle, pull back on the, on the rotor full just like you would normally do follow through and let that come down on the nose well. If it is directly across the runway, very strong, say over 15 knots, You've got some nice taxiways here and what I've done in the past when I've needed to in these particular cases where I've had to do this, I've actually called that I was going to land on 3.5 long and I've landed sideways and dropped it exactly right on the runway. Done a 180 and exited. That way I cleared everything, made sure that they knew what I was doing and I landed into the wind directly and sat down right on the runway. Remember, it's a matter of safety when it comes to landing on the runway. And if you need to get down and make it safe, and you have to, the length of this taxiway is usually about three or 400 feet. And that's normally plenty of length to land a gyro if necessary, if it's clear. One more thing about crosswinds. Something I noticed last May. I was landing in heavy crosswinds with a student simulating engine outs. Now, the crosswind wasn't a direct cross like this. It was probably coming in, oh, maybe at a 45 degree angle on cross. We were coming down like this, making a turn, and then coming around and landing. But if you notice, if you have a crosswind coming like this, and you're going slow, when we made this turn on one of these, and we had the engine out, we were maintaining our best glide speed, which in my aircraft is about 55 knots. But for some reason we dropped rapidly, and then uh, when I kicked it around to get it back into the uh, direction of the wind, we started to uh, stabilize. And I got on the ground, I wanted to make sure what was really going on here. What I thought of is that when you are in best glide and you're coming down like this, and you have the crosswind coming like this, and you make your turn like this, it's actually hitting the rotor at an angle. And even though you have airflow coming from the bottom, in the turn, because you're dragging it through, it is offset a little bit by wind catching it from the top, and it tends to want to slow down possibly a little bit of RPM or create a situation that's dangerous. Then you make the turn into the wind, and it catches it again, and you can land it. I would have make sure that if you're in strong crosswinds, don't practice engine outs anymore. We don't do that in strong crosswind simply for that fact and that reason. And I think it's possible that other people may have experienced problems going at very slow altitude, I mean, going very slow at low altitudes in a crosswind like that, practicing engine outs and actually having that gyro fall out of the air because of the angle that the blade was in that final turn on base in relationship to the crosswind hitting it from that angle here, even though they have some flow from the bottom, it wasn't enough to compensate and it started to have a rapid altitude rated descent. Now I have a couple of examples on video of a landing done from an emergency descent where right at the end it actually crabs a little and then is corrected with a little bit of power to come in for a correct landing. Normally on landing, you want to just have it come in, wait for it, wait for it, let it come in on its own, bleed it off smooth, let those rear wheels come down nice, or the tail wheel first, keeping it straight when it lands and trying to practice that as well as you can. And then once again, letting that nose wheel come down and keeping your feet straight right when it touches so that it doesn't dart one way and roll the gyro over the other direction. This is an example of a vertical descent where upon landing there was a slight balloon and then a crab that was corrected with power to come down to land correctly. This has been Desmond Butts, Gyro CFI. 